So my late grandparents uh, lived in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and they just had just such an interesting marriage. I love them dearly. I loved them dearly. I miss them dearly. Uh, but they were in, in a season of my life. My parents uh, divorced when I was two years old, and my mom was going to school full time, working full time, you know, just trying to survive. And it was just interesting times. And my grandparents stepped up in a big way. They would uh, take my brother and I to school. And I just remember weekends where we would spend the night. And, uh, but my, my grandfather, you know, he grew up in the Great Depression. Um, he would definitely fit into the category of a man that was not super in tune with his emotions. I'm not sure if I ever heard him tell me that he loved me, but he showed it through his actions. He was one of those kind of guys. He was a former Marine, a lieutenant detective, so he had seen and experienced some things in his life. But there's this one particular story towards the, uh, the tail end of their life that I think is pretty funny. Can I tell it to you? So my grandmother, uh, she was, uh, she was uh, taking a bath, and uh, she was getting close to um, finishing her bath, and she, she yelled out to, uh, to my grandfather, and maybe this is TMI, so forgive me, uh, Grandma Gramps. They're gone, so I feel like I can share the story now. Uh, oh, shoot, Lord, don't, don't, don't throw down fire on me today. So she shouts from the bathtub, hey, Frank. It was probably like, hey, Frank, can you go get my underwear that's drying in the dryer? My grandpa probably grunted a little bit, oh, okay, Carolyn, and uh, walked down the stairs. And he gets uh, into the dryer and he recognizes that the clothes are still a little bit damp. So my grandfather, now here's the thing. Um, it was so interesting. He liked to read the newspaper and there were certain mornings where his newspaper was a little wet. And so one of the things that he would do is he would take his wet newspaper and he would put it in the microwave. I dry that newspaper up real quick. So he goes down and he grabs the underwear and they're a little damp. What do you think's going through his mind? I'm going to be strategic. I'm not going to run that dryer any longer. I'm taking these straight to the microwave. So my man puts these undies in the microwave. The story goes that next thing you know, the undies catch on fire. Like he pulls the undies out of the microwave and there's these small little holes all throughout the underwear with like burn marks on the circle. So you would think a loving husband at that, at that point would walk back downstairs and try to find a new pair and figure some sort of situation out. But the man went in there and handed the underwear with holes to my grandmother. Now, I wasn't there, but I heard the story, and she said she about lost her mind. You think she was a little bit offended by that? Come on. Offended. It's interesting, because in marriage, it, it, there's, come on now, marriage is like an equal opportunity offender, like every day. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, yeah, were you like in our car while we were driving here? You're still bitter. And um, it's just interesting in this life, you know, we, we walk through a fence. You've been talked to behind your back. You ever felt that before? Been lied to, stolen from, cheated on, abandoned, abused. This life is tough, man. It's full of hurt, pain, and loss, isn't it? It's so interesting because I think we can all say that we've been offended in here. But have you ever been the offender? Some of you are like, yeah, I can relate to your grandma. How about can you relate to my grandpappy? Some of you are like, oh, no, no, I never offend. That's what's offensive to everybody around you. Sorry, I'm just bursting bubbles this morning. It's interesting because we've been offended We've offended. We've all done stupid stuff. And I think it's interesting because 
We just can refer to this stupid stuff as sin against God and one another and our humanity and our brokenness. We hurt each other. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever struggled to receive forgiveness from God? In other words, you've lived your life. You've been the offender. You've made these stupid choices. You've made some mistakes in your life. It's interesting because I talk to certain individuals. I invite certain individuals to church and I've had dialogue and conversations and their literal feeling is this, that if I walked into the church, it would burn down. Those are the exact words that I've heard from people in our community. There's some people that think they're too far gone, and Pastor Todd's going to talk about this. There's people that think it's over, that they've missed it, that there's no way God could forgive me for that. But I want to ask you a question. Have you ever struggled to extend forgiveness to others? Maybe you're in this place today, and you've held on to bitterness or resentment for years, even decades. Perhaps you've convinced yourself that the person who hurt you doesn't deserve your forgiveness, or maybe you simply don't know how to let go of the pain. We've all been there. We've all been there. But here's the good news. The good news is this, is that God is ready to forgive us. He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to forgive me. He wants, he wants us to take that forgiveness and extend it to others. Isn't it interesting how God, there's like a flow to this forgiveness thing. God forgives us and then he empowers us to forgive others. It's like a river. It's like a flow, the flow of forgiveness. But how many of you know that resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness stops the flow? It stops us from experiencing the peace of God. It stops us from experiencing peace with God. It stops us from experiencing peace with the people around us. Do you believe it? Have you experienced it? I want to acknowledge your pain and your hurt and your loss in this place today. God empathizes with you. We live in this fallen world, this sin-ridden world, and I'm so sorry that you've had to walk through what you've had to walk through. But I want you to know this, that God wants to comfort you through the pain, the hurt, and the loss. He wants you to know today that he is Elroy, the God that sees you. It's so interesting because we all walk through painful situations. This week I was out in Colorado, and one year ago at the same event, I was sitting next to this guy by the name of Ken Costa. Now the joke was, don't go sit to that Don't go sit next to that man because he'll read your mail. Well, I went up and sat next to him and he read my mail. And it was so interesting because all of a sudden I'm having a conversation with him and I don't know how he brought me there, but somehow he brought me back to the yellow couch that I sat on at two years old when my parents shared that they were getting divorced with me. And he asked me a question. Where was Jesus in that moment? As the tears went down my face, I realized that in the moment where I felt maybe some abandonment, it was then that Jesus was choosing me. See, there are broken and fragmented pieces in our heart, and God wants to love you in those spaces and places. And I just believe that today, come on now, I believe it. There's a river of reconciliation coming and a flood of forgiveness that is going to flow in this house when we get the revelation of how much God has forgiven us. For some of us, it's not getting the revelation for the first time. It's remembering the revelation of how much we've been forgiven because the forgiver wants to forgive others through you. And it's so interesting because in this particular Psalm chapter 86, David, in this statement that I just couldn't get off of, It's so interesting because we love to teach the Bible expositionally here. It's kind of tricky in Psalms because you're like, how do I do this, man? It's like they're all over the place. There's not really a flow to this psalm. (laughs) Come on, PT's out here laughing. And so this week I'm like, man, Lord, what do you want to speak to your people? What do you want to speak through this psalm? Let's just read the first seven verses. There's just one verse that I really want us to lean into today. Can we do that? 
Psalm chapter 86, starting in verse one, it says this. Bend down, O Lord, and hear my prayer. So here's David. David's the author of this, this particular psalm, and he's writing this prayer. He's saying, answer me, for I need your help. David wasn't afraid to cry out when he needed help. He said, protect me, for I'm devoted to you. Save me, for I serve you and trust you. You are my God. I love this line here. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I'm calling on you constantly. Give me happiness, O Lord, for I give myself to you. Verse five, O Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Listen closely to my prayer, O Lord. Hear my urgent cry. I will call to you whenever I'm in trouble and you will answer me. I've titled this message, The Flow of Forgiveness, Finding True Freedom. Who wants freedom in this house today? I want us to zone in on verse number five because I think it's really powerful. He says, oh Lord, you are so good. And I just couldn't get off this line right here. So ready to forgive. So ready to forgive. We have to understand this, that the Bible tells us that forgiveness is a core component of the Christian faith. In fact, and in a moment, we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about this particular subject, but I think it's so interesting that we're heading towards Resurrection Sunday, and in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said this, Father, as he hung there on the cross, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgiveness is an essential piece of our faith and David's writing right here that God is so ready to forgive. Now, this word forgive in the Hebrew is selach, which means to pardon, forgive, or spare. And this word conveys the idea of lifting or carrying away a burden or debt as well as canceling or releasing someone from the consequences of their action. So I think it's so interesting because we're we're looking at this Psalm, David. David was a king in the Old Testament for God's chosen people. Pastor Jim just broke this down, the difference between how sin was dealt with in the Old Testament versus how it's dealt with in the New Testament. How sin was dealt with in the Old Covenant and how sin is dealt with in the new covenant. Come on, is anybody thankful that we don't have to travel to the temple and bring a little lamb with us and get your car all stinky, but we can look to the lamb of God, the one who took away our sin for all of eternity. Is anybody thankful for the blood that cover us? Not just temporarily, but forever. That's what Jesus has done. So ready to forgive, so ready to forgive, so ready to take it away. And as I was reading this particular text, I was actually sitting in Panera Bread. Shout out Panera Bread. Oh, wow. Okay, get back to the teaching. I just got back, some of y'all back in though. Okay, here we go. But it was so interesting because I just couldn't get off this, this line so ready to forgive. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit asked me a few questions. Do you ever get that when you're reading the word? Can I, re- can I share the questions with you? I felt like the Holy Spirit said this to me. You can write this down. He said this, if I'm so ready to forgive, why are you so reluctant to receive? For some of us, we're not reluctant to receive. We are like giddy. We're like, yeah, thank you, God. (laughs) And you're receiving his forgiveness. And God followed up with a question for me and for you. And he said this, if you are so ready to receive, why are you so reluctant to extend? (laughs) 
So I think here's the two questions I want to work with today that I think we really need to wrestle with. We need to answer for ourselves. We need to come to terms with. I'm hoping by the end of this teaching that you will have the answers to these questions. And here they are. Are you ready or reluctant to receive forgiveness? And number two, are you ready or reluctant to extend forgiveness? Come on, there's a flow to forgiveness. The forgiver wants to forgive you and then forgive through you. That's the flow. He wants to forgive you and then forgive through you. You can't do this in your own flesh, your own strength. You need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it takes humility. So if you're a person who likes to write points down, you can write down my first point, and it's this, forgiven and forgiving. I believe that this is what God would want us to understand, that, that we need to be forgiven and then forgiving to be in the flow, to walk in freedom, to be in the flow. Come on, you know what it's like to be in the flow, to be at peace with God, to be at peace with your people, to be in the Everybody knows what flow feels like, right? You've been in the flow. Whether you're an athlete, you've been in the flow. You're in business. Come on now, you've been in the flow. You're in the gym. Oh yeah, come on. Some of y'all are in the flow. Hello, somebody, you're in the flow. Y'all know what flow feels like. <laughs> Forgiven and forgiving flow. Well, it's interesting because I think that when David talks about and this, this idea of God being so ready to forgive, you have to understand that, that he's not crying out for mercy or writing these sort of statements because he knows, but it's because he's experienced the forgiveness of God. Do you remember the moment in 2 Samuel chapter 12? You guys know the, the, the story. David is supposed to be uh, at war with his warriors. He's supposed to be at war, but he decides to, to stay home. And because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, maybe that's a word for somebody in here, he finds himself on the rooftop of his place. And next thing you know, he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. Hello. He's like, hello, who is that? So he has his little crew go get her. And next thing you know, uh, he gets Bathsheba pregnant. Bathsheba is married to a warrior that is on his front lines. And so what does David do? Rather than confessing it and dealing with it, he tries to cover it up. Come on, has anybody been guilty of that in here? Hello, some of you are like, no way am I raising my hand in here. But it's true, we try to cover it up, we try to justify it, we try to explain it away, and that's what David tried to do. He brought his warrior back. He was thinking, I'm just gonna have the warrior sleep with his wife, and they'll think that it's their kid, and it'll be all good. Well, this guy was like, so distraught and disturbed that he was brought off the battlefield that he's like, there's no way I'm going to sleep with my wife because I shouldn't be here. I should be out there. So David tries to cover this thing up. But don't you know that God will find a way to expose the things that we try to cover up? It's not if, it's just a matter of when. It's not because he hates us, it's because he loves us. The exposure is a good thing. And the prophet Nathan, uh, you know, it's interesting how he goes about this, but he, he gets to David's heart by sharing a parable or like a, a story about this guy who wronged this other guy. And David's like, no way. How, we got, no, that guy needs to be dead. And the prophet Nathan's like, that's you. <laughs> oh, don't you love those people? They love you and slap you at the same time. That was Nathan. It's interesting because in that moment, David responds. Like there's just a... There's a quickened response here. So he's delaying, he's covering up, he's delaying, he's denying in his own heart, he's not accepting it. And this is the process that many of us walk through. But he gets to this moment with Nathan, and here's what comes out of his mouth when Nathan confronts him. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan replies, look at this. Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. This is a clear declaration of God's forgiveness of David despite his grievous sin. This moment in David's life illustrates the mercy and grace of God 
who is willing to forgive even the most serious sins. It was immediate. Immediate. So when David is writing, he's so ready to forgive. It's because he's experienced it. And I want you to experience it too. So if you came in here today and you've been covering it up, you've been running from it, you've been letting the guilt and shame keep you in bondage, in prison, I'm here to declare over your life today that immediately God is so ready. When you hear so ready, what's the picture that you get? Have you ever seen them horses when they're getting ready to race in a, in a, in a race? They're like in that thing that like, that's what I look. That's what I just think. I think like our God, our God is in heaven. He's like looking at your life. And it's so interesting because God will bring like some of you, like this is your fourth week here. In the first week you walked in, God was like, oh, here we go. Yes. I'm so ready to forgive them. So close. You walked out. But he doesn't give up. This is how I read the Bible, man. I see these pictures. God's so ready to forgive you. You are not too far gone. If he can do it for David, he can do it for you. If he did it for me, he will do it for you. If he did it then, he'll do it now. If he'll do it now, he'll do it in the future. Do you believe it in the place today? We serve a forgiving God. A forgiving God. Forgiven. It's so interesting because we read about this forgiveness that David receives, and it made me start to think about a few things about forgiveness. And I just want to just bring some clarity. I'm going to riff through these really quick. I don't have time to like spend a lot of time. Catch these if you can. Write them down. But forgiveness from God is not these five things. Forgiveness from God is not a license to sin. Forgiveness from God is not an excuse to avoid consequences. Forgiveness from God does not always mean immediate relief. Forgiveness from God does not mean we have to forgive others without boundaries. Forgiveness from God is not based on our merit. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't prove yourself worthy of it. It is his grace. It's a gift that you and I need to receive. Now, here's what forgiveness is. I'm going to give you a five. Forgiveness from God is this. It's rooted in his character of love and mercy. That word ready actually in the Hebrew is hunan, and it actually means compassion and mercy. <laughs> it's rooted in his character of love and mercy. Number two, it's immediate. God is eager to forgive. Number three, it's unconditional. It is not dependent on our actions or merit. Number four, it's available to all. Every single person in this place, regardless of past mistakes or sins. And number five, it's complete, leaving no trace of guilt or shame. Come on, somebody. The flow of forgiveness, the flow of forgiveness. The forgiver wants to forgive you and then forgive through you. Second Samuel chapter 19. So David's been forgiven, right, of this crazy, crazy moment, this, this season in his life where he fell away. And in 2 Samuel chapter 19, David's son Absalom rebels against him. Do you remember this? Bible scholars, do you remember this? So David has a son, Absalom. Absalom is actually trying to take and become king. It's so, such an interesting a story that really uh, results in this tragic death. A battle in which Absalom is killed. And after the battle, David is grieving. I mean, can you imagine? He loses a son. But then in the midst of this, he's confronted by Joab, his military commander, who challenges him to show more concern for the soldiers who risk their lives to defend David. So David takes this criticism to heart from Joab, and he decides to return to Jerusalem and resume his reign as king. So it's interesting because as he's returning to Jerusalem, he's confronted by a man named Shimei. Now, Shimei had cursed David and thrown stones at him during his flight from Jerusalem. So in this moment of confrontation, Shimei is begging David for mercy. And here's the interesting part. David responds by showing him grace and forgiveness. Look at what it says in 2 Samuel 19, 23. 
David says this in response to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king, meaning him, David, will show you kindness for the sake of my father Saul and restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. You ever been stabbed in the back? People talking trash about you. David's saying to this guy, you always have a place at my table. That's going in the opposite spirit. And let me, let me just, I want us to catch this because those who have been forgiven much forgive much. You've heard it said that if you've been forgiven much, you love much. Love oftentimes flows through forgiveness. That's how we extend the love. It's so interesting. This is just different, but this is what we've been, been called to the flow of forgiveness, forgiven much, and then forgiving, forgiven much, and then forgiving. And David the writer of Psalm chapter 86 is showing us through two examples of his life and how to operate in this. God is ready to forgive you, but he's also ready to forgive through you. Is anybody thankful for the grace and mercy of God? Forgiven and forgiving so that we can be point number two, free and flowing. Anybody want to be free in this place today? Now, I want to turn our attention to what Jesus has to say about this particular parable, because we see the example of David walking it out like in the manner that I think God would have us. But in Matthew chapter 18, it's so interesting because here's Jesus with his disciples, his crew, his tribe, the 12 guys that he selected. And one of the loud mouths by the name of Peter raises his hand, I'm certain, and asks Jesus a question. And he says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Jesus responds by saying, you should forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. I'm not a math major, but that's a whole lot. It's a lot of forgiveness. And then Jesus moves into telling this parable. And Jesus is telling this story of a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. One servant owed him an enormous sum of money equivalent to millions in today's dollars. Now this king ordered this servant and his family to be sold into slavery to repay the debt. But the servant did this. He begged for mercy and the king, I love this, moved with compassion, forgave the debt and released him. So here's Jesus telling this story of this man that owes this massive debt. And then he cries for mercy. And the king moved with compassion, releases him from it. I want to pause here before I go to the rest of the parable, because I think that this potentially is a word for those of you that have never received, received forgiveness. Before you receive forgiveness, You need to first recognize that there's a debt that you owe. I would imagine that this man owed this money for a while, but when it was time to pay up is when he pleaded for mercy. It's interesting how the urgency of the consequence of the debt that he owed caused him to cry out for mercy. And maybe you walked in here today and you've never received the forgiveness of God on your life. And I'm here to declare to you today, because I love you, that this life is short. I'm learning the brevity of life, the further and further I go, and we aren't guaranteed another day. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe in this moment, you can recognize your sin debt in this moment. For we've all missed the mark. Some of us are pro sinners. Some of us are amateur sinners. Some of us owe a million dollar debt and some of us $10, but it's all the same. A debt is a debt. And the reality is we can't pay this debt off. This debt must be forgiven by our master. And if that's you in this place today, I pray that that revelation of this debt that's hanging over your life would cause you today to receive forgiveness from your master because he did it for you. 
He paid the debt off in the form of his son, Jesus, who will celebrate this coming Sunday, who came to planet Earth and lived the life that you and I couldn't. He died the death that you and I deserved. And when he hung there on a cross, he bridged the gap and made a way for us to be restored back into right relationship with our God. I don't want you to take your last breath and stand in judgment before the king, having not received forgiveness from him. Today is your day. Today is your day. But it's so interesting. Can I get, a, can I get you to come up here? You to come up here. Kyle, come on up here. Come on up here. Come on, KB. PT, come on up here. PB, come on up here. You two, come on up here. Yeah, hazukas. I want you guys to just surround me. PT, stay out, outside of, you guys just form like a fence around me. Surround me here. Let's let these two get in the circle too. It's interesting because as you read this parable, this servant who was forgiven a large debt then leaves, probably filled with so much joy, and he goes and he chases down somebody that owed him just a little bit of money. And when this individual cries out for mercy, this servant that has been forgiven this massive debt puts this other servant in prison. So the king that released this servant from this massive debt catches wind of what happened, and he says, oh, no, 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 and he sends that servant into prison. See, this is a picture of unforgiveness. This is a picture of how so many of us are living, that we've been forgiven this great debt on our life. We are willing to receive forgiveness, but not extend it. And just like this servant in the parable gets sent into prison, I'm here to declare over your life that unforgiveness keeps you in a prison. It stops the flow. An offense becomes a fence around your life that becomes a barricade for you experiencing intimacy with God and intimacy with people. And I brought Pastor Todd up here for the picture. Because being surrounded by this fence of offense, this unforgiveness, I can only experience so much intimacy with him. This is a picture of what unforgiveness, of what offense can do for our life. But I'm here to declare today that by the power of our spirit, we can't wrestle our way out of this place. But we need someone to come and save us, to pull us out of this, to remind us today that he has forgiven us and released us of this massive debt. Come on, is anybody thankful? You guys can take a seat. That's a picture, though, in this place. So let's stand our feet because I believe that God wants to reestablish flow in your life. I remember a few years ago, before we moved out of our house, our master shower was like the water was barely dripping. Anybody ever had that? Yeah, it's brutal. We didn't have the whole like system in your house that takes away the hard water. And so I didn't know what to do. I don't know how to fix it. All I know is I want hot water and I want it to come with some force. So I call one who's uniquely qualified, a plumber. I said, man, I don't know what's going on, but I need your help. And uh, I was there with him and he unscrewed the the shower head and looked into the valve and there was all this buildup of like calcium and from this hard water that was prohibiting the flow. And so the one that was uniquely, uniquely qualified started carving that out and uh, put that shower head back on and I took a shower and I said, hallelujah. <laughs> he reestablished the flow. He was uniquely qualified, and I know one that's uniquely qualified, and his name is Jesus. And he wants to reestablish flow in your life. He wants to forgive you today. 
and empower you to forgive the people around you. And so I want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? Because I believe this, that as I was wrapping up my study, God said this. There's a group of you in here that today you are being convinced of your need to extend forgiveness. But there's another group in here today that you're convinced of your need to extend forgiveness, but you are convicted of your need to receive forgiveness. So those opportunities are available today no matter what camp you're in. And if you came in here today and I was describing you just a few moments ago, you feel like you've never received forgiveness from God. Maybe today, for the first time in your life, you're recognizing that, wait a second, it's not about showing up to church, it's not how much I give, it's not about giving money to the homeless, like, those things don't make me right. No, God didn't, can't come to make bad people good, he came to make dead people alive. You and I, we need forgiveness, we need the debt to be removed, and Jesus did it when he died on the cross, and his blood can cover you today, once and for all. You won't be uh, you will be made positionally perfect, but practically you will be in process and that's okay because I'm with you. So God, we just come before you right now in this moment. I pray that for those in here that, that they're being stirred up, they know there's somebody that they need to forgive. God, I pray that they wouldn't wait any longer, that they would release it, that the same forgiveness that they receive would be released. It would, it would, it would be granted. It would be extended. And, and God, I pray that if, if, if they've been through something really difficult, that they would get surrounded. They would get some counsel. They would walk through a process uh, in their own heart so that they can be free, free, like totally free, walking in freedom because your word declares that who the sun sets free is free indeed. You've called us to be sons and daughters that walk in freedom. And so I prophesy and pray freedom over your sons and daughters today. I pray that they would lay it down. They would pick up your grace and your mercy and they would begin walking in a new flow. And for those that are in the room that have never received forgiveness, God, I pray that today would be the day, that today would be the day that they would receive your grace and your mercy. It wouldn't be of your own good work. It would be your unconditional love working and moving in their hearts. In Jesus' name. The band's going to play.